Hello plant lovers, Matthew welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. I do post every week about cold, cool, intermediate orchids I'm growing here in Melbourne without any uh, greenhouse or heating or humidifying or grow lights or any of that sort of malarkey. So if that's of interest, do hit subscribe. And today, look at this fabulous, fabulous beauty. <gasps> This plant lovers is Rossioglossum grande. And why do you think it might have grande as the suffix to its name? Perhaps because the flowers are so big and fabulous. Yes, plant lovers, let us take a deep dive into this cool, too warm growing orchid. You know, I don't really understand how an orchid can grow from warm to cool conditions, but bless you, Rossio Glossum grande, because you can, and this baby lives outdoors all year. All right, let's look at basics. First of all, that is the orchid. And as you can see, um, not particularly massive leaf and pseudobulb structure, quite a, a tidy little orchid, but look at the size of the flowers in comparison to the plant. Massive, perhaps that's why it's called grande. It is, like many orchids, an epiphyte. I guess what makes this different is that it grows in quite high altitude deciduous forests, which gives you a bit of a key as to how to look after it. It's found from Mexico down to Panama at high altitudes. So first thing is then temperature. As we've said, it is described as cold to warm, which means that covers a multitude of sins. Now, as you know, I am in Melbourne, Southeast Australia, and we are described as either warm temperate or cool Mediterranean climate. What that means is that we have cold, wet winters that don't freeze. So we can get almost to zero or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, cold but not freezing. Summers, however, can be dry and hot, but they can also be a little bit chilly and a little bit wet. It can go either way. So that's the environment for Melbourne, which sometimes often appears on the most livable city list. So it can't be that bad climatically. But the point of that little diatribe is that this baby is living outdoors all the time. It's undercover, it's protected from the elements, but it gets plenty of indirect filtered light, but it doesn't get rained on, and that's the important thing. But it is exposed to nighttime temperatures, which can drop to one, two, three, four, five degrees Celsius, which can be, you know, um, 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can get quite chilly. And this baby thrives. So that's the first thing, temperature. Um, as it's a warm grow as well, I guess you could try it in a much warmer environment than mine. Let's see. And perhaps if anyone is growing it much warmer, you can let us know in the messages below. So as it is a high altitude epiphyte, but in deciduous forests, there are two things to bear in mind. Firstly, there is less moisture in winter, but more light. So obviously, if you imagine the leaves are falling off trees and this is an epiphyte, it's gonna get much stronger light in winter and it's gonna get much more dappled light in summer. So that's a key thing to bear in mind. The other thing is where it comes from in that spine of mountains that snakes down through Central America is that the winters are comparatively dry and the summers are much damper and moister and more humid. So it needs much more moisture and humidity during the summer and less so in winter, but it does need more light and it does love a chill. So what I'm doing is I am giving it a little watering, maybe once every 10 days. I'm certainly not drenching it. And I'm doing that on a sunny morning when the ambient temperature is quite warm in winter. In summer, much more. It will be not kept moist. This is when it gets quite tricky, isn't it? But I won't let it dry out. Basically in summer, I'm gonna water it more at least once a week. Depending on the ambient temperature, if it's much hotter, of course, every couple of days. But as you can see from the pseudobulbs, it's quite, it's quite tough, has great capacity to store water. So it's not gonna be that high maintenance. And I haven't had it for a full calendar year yet. So I can't really attest to peak summer conditions yet, but that's what I intend to do. Uh, it's an epiphyte, so medium wise, I have got a loose medium sized bark mix with perlite, with charcoal, with a little bit of shell grit, which is a chicken food, as we know, full of calcium, which orchids love, and a little bit of sphagnum moss chopped up. So that's in the mix. And my secret ingredient, mycorrhizal fungi, which, as we know, promotes healthy root growth and assists the plant access nutrients that are in the medium. And then let us look at the flowers. Aren't they spectacular? 
it can bloom from late autumn through into winter. We are midwinter in Melbourne. This spike um, has taken a while to mature. So I would imagine the spike set, yeah, actually in late autumn and it's now midwinter, so about two months. The flowers individually took quite a long time to open. It was sort of almost a week between each one, but they are quite long lasting. I am told, this is the first time it's flowered, so I'm very excited, but they seem to be quite strong flowers and the first one that opened is still very perky. So I imagine I'm gonna get quite a, a good length of time out of this blooming. So then just technically, as you can see, the flower spike emerges from the base of the pseudobulb. So not from any sort of leaf joint, as is the case with many sorts of orchids, but instead it just emerges from the pseudobulb. And as you can see, this is a division and the pseudobulb that's flowered is the newest. So again, I haven't had it for calendar year, but I am here to assume that the newest growth is capable of blooming and the older bulbs are just supporting the plant with nutrient. So as with many orchids, the name of the game is plant lovers. Yes, vegetative growth. And to do that, of course, you need good medium, the right watering and fertilizer. Now, when I pot my orchids, I always put some grains of generic slow release fertilizer in the mix, which this has. So I will then top dress a little bit of a same pellet, slow release, general fertilizer in spring across the top, not touching any roots. And then as the weather starts to warm up, about once every second watering, I give it a diluted solution of a seaweed-based fertilizer, diluted to about one-eighth the, um, the dosage that's on the bottle, which is more like a tonic than a fertilizer. When the spikes are emerging and before the flowers open, I do tend to, with all of my orchids, water them with a bloom-specific, so high nitrogen-based soluble fertilizer again depends on the orchid depends on the time of year but you know that's a bit of a a bit of a rule of thumb but again I don't have an extraordinary fertilizing schedule that I stick to so you know grab it while you can I say orchids but look at the blooms they are the most amazing flowers and it is called boca de tigre tiger's mouth as you can see why it's kind of got tigery stripes but so essentially it's sort of a yellow an amazing butter yellow with this sort of what are you gonna call that? Almost like mahogany, polished mahogany ochre in the middle. And then these incredible striped elements of the two colors. So it's essentially two colors in various configurations, but they are amazing. And as you can see from my hand, quite a big size, hence the name Grande. And there is a very faint, light kind of lemony fragrance, but it is incredibly faint. You'd have to get your nose really into it. So I'm not sure that this is an orchid to really focus on the fragrance for. It is really more about the flower. And look at that. Oh, isn't it just the most sensational thing? I am very happy with that. So plant lovers, so far I'm here to tell you it is pretty low maintenance. You know, I'm dribbling some water in winter, keeping it on the dry side. In summer, ramping it up. There's plenty of ambient humidity. Melbourne is not particularly dry. Our ambient humidity in winter is just shy of 60% and in summer it's around the 50%. So it's fairly even, reasonable enough for most orchids. In summer I do douse about a lot around the floor of the growing area so that there is more ambient humidity but um, this baby seems to be fine. So I guess the only important thing is to try and give it more winter light and then dappled shade in summer which is a little like a Mazda Valia. So that's the kind of care I'm giving it. A little bit of strong filtered morning winter light and then in summer it's going to be dappled and protected. So there we are. Rossio Glossum Grande who is named after Mr Ross in the 1840s who was an orchid collector you are sensational. And if you're living in a cool or a cold area like mine and you don't have a heated greenhouse, then this, Plant Lovers, is an orchid for you. There we are. Thank you very much. I hope you have loved looking at this as I have loved sharing it. It's so beautiful. Thank you very much for watching and thank you for subscribing if you have done. I do post every week, so if you're interested in my amateur struggles through the world of cold, cool, intermediate orchids, do hit subscribe and join me. Great to know your thoughts if you're growing this anywhere in the world to see how you're going. It's always great to have comparisons. Meantime, I'm very happy. We shall do another check-in next year to see if I've had new growths and new flower spikes because you never know, things can happen. But in the meantime, take care wherever you are and I look forward to seeing you next week.